Thanks, Brenda. Uh, start by thanking the department for the invitation. It's a pleasure and honour to be here. Um, as Brendan said, um, I'm interested in connections between, um, well, quantum physics and graph theory, algebraic graph theory. Um, there's not going to be any physics um, here today, so you don't need to worry on that score. Uh, the, um, there's a brief outline. None of those words there will mean very much, except maybe complete graphs and bipartite graphs, but we'll, um, we'll get there. Uh, so I want to start, I've got quantum walks in the title. Now, um, well, this is a bit of a brutal way of starting. The, well, I'll say in my defense, this is not my definition, this is the physicist's definition. This is what they want to use for quantum walks. So a quantum walk, um, actually they come in two flavors, continuous and discrete, but today I'm just talking about continuous. Quantum walks are based on graphs. So you start with a graph, okay, and you're going to construct something which a physicist will call a quantum walk on the graph. Now, how do you do that? Well, you work with the adjacency matrix of the graph, and I'll always use A for that. So that's the adjacency matrix. So it's a symmetric 0, 1 matrix, and the ij entry is 1 if the ith and jth vertices are adjacent, otherwise it's 0. Um, I've got one written down explicitly in a minute. Now, so the physicists say that the quantum work is, walks described by this family of matrices, and it's given as the exponential of ITA. And, well, you can compute the exponential in principle by writing out the sum, and there it is. Um, so it's a matrix, and it depends on T. And the physicists are going to ask questions about how the properties of the, this matrix or family of matrices depends on the underlying graphs. Now, my... Um, one thing I've learned in my career is that, you know, that when you've got mathematics that interacts with other areas, biology or chemistry or physics, um, it's often more or less a guarantee that it's going to be more interesting than just picking a random problem. So instead of just picking some problem in algebraic graph theory, I can pick a problem in algebraic graph theory which has interpretation in chemistry or interpretation in physics. And this is the physics. So we have this matrix. Okay, now I say a bit more about actually calculating it, but there's a sum, so that will do for definition. Um, the other comment I want to make, it's a unitary matrix. If you do know any quantum physics, then of course, you know, they like to play with unitary matrices, and that's why this is unitary, but we don't need to worry too much about that. Okay, so let's take a, a, a little example, the path on two vertices. This already turns out to be instructive. So there's its adjacency matrix, and so I'm going to have to compute, this is one, the one case where you can compute the exponential by the, using the sum formula, because A squared is the identity, A cubed is A again, A fourth is the identity, so you can work out the explicitly u of t, and you can write it in two ways. You can write it as cosine of t times identity plus i sine t times the adjacency matrix, or you can write it out in this form. And you, if you check, you can check if you care, this is unitary. It's also worth noting that it's symmetric. And normally when you're playing with unitary matrices, you're not playing with symmetric matrices, but on this occasion, our matrix u of t is symmetric, and that plays a role at various points. We don't need to think about it too much, it's there. Okay, so there it is. So the point is you can calculate it in this situation, and that's the um, U of T for the path on two vertices. Now, um, just to give some idea of the complexity, um, you can do this for any graph you choose. So it's nice to pick some nice, simple, regular graph. So let's take the cycle on five vertices. Okay, so in principle, like, okay, so now computing U of T for the cycle on, on five vertices. Now the entries, U of T is a complex matrix. And I'm just looking at the zero, 1 entry of that matrix. It's a function of time. It's a complex number. So I can plot it, and I did. Actually, Gable, my student or colleague, Gable Catino, did it, but I've done it too. So you can plot it. And there's, you know, that's the pattern you get. Um, now, it's the, the question I have, and which I can't answer, um, is there a time t for which, at, at time 0, so u of c5 at time 0 is 0. The 0, 1 entry at time 0 is 0. The question I'm asking is, is it ever 0 again? So just go back to the picture. <laughs> you can't tell, <laughs> of course. Um, and um, I don't really even know where to start. But it's a, um, you'll see later on there are reasons for caring about when entries of u of t are 0 or not. Um, in a certain sense, that's one of the basic questions. So already you have some problems. Um, you know, which are simple and easy to state. I mean, you've got to be able to compute that U of C5, but once you have it, my question simply is, well, is it ever zero? Um, now, uh, 
Okay, so that was just the, the I want to get back to the, or get onto the um, more serious problems. Well, problems where we know more about it. Um, for that, I'm going to be using the Sher product of matrices. So this is the entry-wise product of two matrices. It's sometimes called the bad student's product of matrices. Um, so, but it's quite straightforward and it's actually it's useful. Uh, so M circle N is the Sher product. Um, and the reason for this is because um, I want to work with something which I'm going to call the mixing matrix. Now, this matri these matrices U of T are describing a quantum system. And the idea is that in some initial state, you let it run for a time T, then you do a measurement and you get a result. Now, your, in this case, your states are vertices of the graph. And your initial state will be a vertex of the graph. Um, and then you do a measurement and the result will be a vertex of the graph. Now, um, th there's a saying that the essence of madness is doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. Um, but that's also the essence of quantum physics. Um, because if you do the same thing, let it run for the same time, start at the same place, do your same measurement, you won't always get the same answer. What you get is a probability distribution. And that's what I'm trying to make explicit here. So at any given time, given your initial state, you'll have a probability distribution, and that's what you're going to ask questions about. You're not allowed to ask questions about the entries of U of T because they're not physical. They can't be measured. Not directly. Okay, so um, the matrix, I so to deal with this, I'm taking my matrix U of T, and I'm just replacing each entry by the square of its absolute value. Perfectly simple. Um, and so it's convenient to write it using the Sher product. There are other ways of doing it, but this works. So that's the matrix. Now, the point about this matrix is its entries are physical. They can be, you can carry out experiments and get measurements, and these are telling you what's going on. Um, the other comment I just made here is that sometimes helps me that the complex conjugate of U of T is actually um, the inverse of UT. This is because of the symmetry property I mentioned earlier. So you can also write this as U of T circle U of minus T. Um, so that helps sometimes. So this is a matrix now, and this is describing in a certain sense what you can actually measure, uh, what you can actually see as properties of your walk. Now, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is, I mean, U of T, well, it's well defined. You can work with it. You can compute anything you want. This Sher product is a fairly brutal operation. And that's one of the things that makes it difficult. If the questions were just relate properties of U of T to properties of the graph, um, life would be, um, well, my life would be easier. Yeah. That's way. Um, now, okay, so we've got this mixing matrix, and again, this is another example just to give you some idea of the complexities. So this time I took the path on four vertices, and okay, so U of T is a four by four matrix. Um, and so I can write, uh, compute um, M of T and look at the entries of M of T. Now these are real numbers, so I can plot these, and what I've plotted here is the one four entry of um, the the mixing matrix for the path on four vertices. And I just did that for t up to time 50. And, um, well, basically it's a bit of a mess. You look at it, you can sort of see patterns, but you can't prove anything that there are any patterns. Um, and, so this is the, and so this is a modest example of the sort of um, behavior you're dealing with. So it's not periodic, for example. There are examples where things are periodic, but it's not periodic in this case. It's actually an almost periodic function. So, you know, and we're going to be asking questions about this. For example, that, um, one question you might simply ask is whether um, that entry is ever one. And that's going to turn out to matter. Now, um, it's not quite clear. It looks like it might be getting close here. Turns out it isn't reaching one. But you can't tell that from the plot. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's another example. So we can, each, so to sum it up, we're going to have our graph A and we have our unitary matrix U of T, it's called a transition matrix, and we have what I'm calling the mixing matrix. And to some extent, we're asking questions about the mixing matrix. Now, once we have this mixing matrix, we can more or less forget about a lot of the physics. We just say, okay, here's the graph, here's the mixing matrix. Is this true or not? Okay, so you, that's why I don't need to spend much more time on the physics. Um, for the path on two vertices, I mean, okay, I wrote down the U of T, and of course, anybody can now write down the mixing matrix. Now, remember, with a unitary matrix, the sum of the squares, the absolute values of the entries of any row or any column is 1. And so that means that the sum of the entries of any row or any column of M is 1. The entries are non-negative, so it's a doubly stochastic matrix. 
and we can think of each row or each column as a probability density supported on the vertices of the graph. So I pick a row and then it gives me the entries of that row give me a probability, probably the first vertex, probably the second vertex and so on. Okay, and so here I just wrote it out for the um, K2. Now the, um, well this is saying formally what I just said, so that um, if the, uh, I'm assuming that, some, that my initial state is given by a vertex and at time t we carry out a measurement and we get a, a vertex. We get a particular vertex with a pro certain probability which depends on the initial vertex and time. Okay, so we need a probability density and that probability density is just the um, A row of MT where A is the vertex you started on. So the rows of MT are giving you all the information that you're allowed to discuss. Okay. Um, and so in particular the B entry or the AB entry of MT is the probability that when you measure at time T the result is the vertex B given that you started on vertex A. Now this is looking a bit like a random walk on graphs and physicists will say that um, continuous quantum walks are analogues of classical continuous walks on graphs. I've never found that statement any help. Um, so you know that uh, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about continuous walks on graphs and I can't see any way of transferring information from that case to this case. Um, it's like saying if I understand the hyperbolic sines and cosines and I don't know all there is to say about sines and cosines and so. Um, um, the, so the next step is simply, okay, so I've established that, you know, I'm getting these probability densities. Now, of course, the whole situation is very complicated and those sort of examples I've drawn or, or put up <coughs> indicates things are fairly messy. So um, you're not going to ask very sophisticated questions at this point. Um, but if your output of your measurement is probability density, um, then there's reason to be natural to ask, what are the extreme cases? Now, from my point of view, there are two extreme cases. One would be where the density is uniform. All vertices were equally likely. The other case would be where the, um, one, where the distribution is, is concentrated on a single vertex. So if you start on vertex A and you measure at time T, the vertex returned is always B. So these would be the two extreme cases. And this is what I'll be talking about for the rest of the lecture. So we have our walk, we've got our probability distributions, there are two extreme types of probability distribution, and that's what I wanted to discuss. So, um, and so basically this comes in two flavors. There's, um, stuff called state transfer and stuff called mixing. Now the state transfer um, is a fairly serious interest to the physicist because in principle it can be used to move information around a quantum network. Um, and so I won't say anything more than that. Um, so let's start with state transfer. Now the idea, well state transfer corresponds to the situation where the, my probability density is concentrated on the vertex. So I start my system in initial states of vertex A, I let it run for a certain time, I carry out my measurement and I, well, oops, I get B every time. So effectively what's happened in this case is this information that can be stored in the, the state A has been moved to state B, um, but we won't go into that. Um, now, the, so we're going to say we have perfect state transfer if um, A, B entry of M of T is equal to 1. So we have perfect state transfer from A to B at time T if the A, B entry of M of T is equal to 1. Now each row of M sums to 1, each column sums to 1, so if you've got an entry equal to 1, everything else in that row and column must be zero. So you're actually forcing a lot of zeros. The other thing is that M of T is symmetric, so you're forcing even more. Um, this won't matter too much. I'm just going to look at, take the simplest possible example really, take the path on two vertices. Um, then you, we, well, if you get, look back to what we did earlier, then U at time pi and two is given by that matrix. And so when you compute the mixing matrix, um, you, you, it's just zero, one, one, zero. And so what this tells you at time pi on two, you have perfect state transfer from vertex one to vertex two for the path on two vertices. Okay, so this is an instance. Um, so if I plotted, did a plot of M of P2 against time, then at time pi on two, I would have a one. I showed you P4 before and I said, is there a one at time 30 or not? And I said, I don't know. It's the same question, okay, but in this case you do hit a one and so um, the system is in some sense behaving more like a classical system and less like a quantic, quantum system. Now, um, this is probably something for the graph theorists. Um, 
the um, for a graph there is I can build up the the hypercube in d dimensions by taking a certain product of the path on two vertices um, and that's a natural graph product uh, physically it corresponds to taking the tensor power of d copies of the u of t so the Cartesian product for graph there is corresponds to just the tensor product of, or chronicle product of matrices um, and so it follows from this for example on the d cube um, at time pi and 2 you st again get perfect state transfer so for a physicist, this is almost a triviality um, because of the meaning of the tensor product in, the, in, the, in their situation. Um, but so that means I now have an infinite family of examples. You pick your d cube, so think of the three cube. Okay, then at time pi and two, you'll get to the state transfer from a, if you start a given vertex. Then at time pi and two, you're at the vertex at maximum distance, the unique vertex at maximum distance. Okay, um, and so you get perfect state transfer there. Um, and so this gives us an infinite family of graphs on which perfect state transfer occurs. And if you're going to spend any time talking about perfect state transfer, it's nice to have more than one example. But okay, so we've got an infinite example. Um, so that's the, the short introduction to um, the perfect state transfer, the case where the probability density was concentrated on a vertex. So now I want to think about the other extreme um, where the um, probability density is uniform. So all vertices are equally likely. So if you actually built the apparatus, you've got the sort of the world's most complicated random number generator, essentially. Um, but we won't worry about that. So the case, so if I get this case where all vertices are likely, I'm going to say I have uniform mixing. Um, but I'll throw a few more words at it first. Um, it's useful, I find, to say a matrix is flat if all its entries have the same absolute value. Now I'm thinking here of a real or complex matrix. If all entries have the same absolute value, it's flat. So simple enough terminology. Um, now, the relevant um, information here is a flat unitary matrix is these days generally known as a um, complex Hadamard matrix. So um, a flat orthogonal matrix would just be what a, a normal Hadamard matrix. Now, if these things don't help you, it doesn't matter too much, but a matrix is flat if all its entries have the same absolute value. And so the point is um, that the, a row of M of T will be constant if and only if the corresponding row of U of T is flat. It's a one by n matrix. Okay, so um, flatness. We, get, we we can think about flatness in terms of u of t, um, or having a, a a row where all entries are equal to one on n in m of t. They're equivalent properties. So two properties. Um, and so um, we say they have uniform mixing at time t on the graph if uh, the entire matrix u of t is flat. So we're being greedy here, or equivalently if the mixing matrix is one over the number of vertices times the all ones matrix. So we're insisting, um, so when we worry about uniform mixing, we want everything to be uniform. Um, there are relaxations of this, which I won't be going into um, for the time being. So in this case, we have uniform mixing. Okay, so M of T um, is equal to just a constant times the all ones matrix. Uh, and well, the path on two vertices works again um, because um, at time pi on four, if you do the calculations, I don't think I did it here. Um, the, you know, okay. So time pi on four, um, cosine of squared of t is one on two. So that's all entries there are one on two at time pi on four. And so m of t is um, one over two times j. And so you have uniform mixing. And the same argument with tensor products or chronic products tells you you also get uniform mixing on the d cube at time pi on four. So, um, so I've told you what perfect state transfer is. I've told you what uniform mixing is, and now I want to go and say a bit more about what we know about them and why it might be interesting. Yes? Can I ask what J is? So J is the matrix of all ones. So matrix of every entry equal to one. Yeah, okay. okay. Any other questions at this point? So now I want to, so I mean, there's been no graph theory involved other than the original, def original definition at this point. So now I want to get a, um, closer to things that are a bit more interesting. So uh, if the problem is, as I said, okay, we're, physicists are interested in perfect state transfer. Um, it is indeed potentially useful, okay? And so you want to find examples where it happens. Now, I've given you an infinite family, K2 and its pow powers, um, but, you know, are there any, any other possibilities? Um, so, you know, what if I just take a path? Okay, there's also, so you can ask these questions. I've got a graph. 
for which pair of I want to find graphs and pairs of vertices where you get perfect state transfer from one to the other. Now, um, the, if you play with this a bit, you think, well, if perfect state transfer occurs, presumably A and B should have some similarity. You're transferring things from one place to the other. Um, so, you know, the, it, it would seem plausible that they should somehow be similar. And I want to outline some results which um, make that more concrete. So, the, uh, well, what I'm going to conclude here is if I have perfect state transfer from A to B, then for each K, the AA entry, so the A diagonal entry of the kth power of A is equal to the B diagonal entry of the kth power of A. So, um, so I mean, in general, you pick an n by n matrix. That's not going to be true. There won't be the entries of the on the diagonal tend to be distinct. Um, but the point I'm saying here is that for any k, the AA entry. So think let's A be one and B be two. The one one entry of A to k and the two two entry of A to k are equal for any k. Now, for graph theorists, um, these numbers have a combinatorial meaning because the AA entry of A to the K counts the number of walks in the graph of length K that start and finish at A. Now, a walk is a sequence of vertices where consecutive terms are adjacent. So you just start in the graph, you move to a neighbor, move to a neighbor, and after K steps, you're back. That's a, walk of, a close walk of length K, and that's counted by this. So this has a combinatorial graph theoretical meaning it's just a convenient way of writing it. And so that gives us a sequence of numbers for this vertex and a sequence for the other vertex, two infinite sequences, and we're saying those two sequences are equal. Now, one consequence of this, um, which I'll, I'll write up again on the screen in a minute, um, I, well, a to the zero is the identity. Okay, so that tells me one was equal to one. Well, yeah, I knew that. Um, for a to the one, um, the diagonal entries are all zero because it's an adjacency matrix, so both sides are zero. A squared is the number of walks of length two. Well, the, a, any diagonal entry, the AA entry of A squared is the number of closed walks of length two that start, or walks of length two that start and finish at A. Now, how can you do that? To get a walk of length two, you're gonna start at A, you're gonna move to a neighbor, and your second step is forced, you're gonna move back. So, for when K is equal to two, this is just the number of neighbors of A. So one consequence of this is, um, if I have perfect state transfer, then the vertices A and B must have the same valency, same degree. Okay, so uh, there is a connection. Um, and so, as I said, that's something that that. And in fact, something stronger is true. Um, it actually implies that the graph I get from X by leading the vertex A, and the graph I get by the vertex, uh, leading the vertex B, have the same character polynomial. Now, that's a somewhat surprising property. Generally, they're going to be different. And that's strong, much stronger than this property. Okay. But, um, so this is a consequence of that. Um, it's standard. It's not entirely trivial. Okay, so um, I guess I'll sketch the proof. Um, the thing to notice, well, I, uh, what first thing I have to do is to give you a, a, a variant, or a slightly different definition of perfect state transfer. Um, the, the, so I, I define perfect state transfer in terms of m of t, um, and now I'm going to do it in terms of u of t. So you get perfect state transfer from a to b at time t if there's a complex number gamma necessarily of norm 1 such that u of t applied to e sub a is gamma times e sub b. This implies that the a b entry of m of t is equal to 1. Okay, so it's equivalent to that. Um, and so the point is I need to work with u of t because I don't want to be trying to factor things through, through um, sure products because, as I said, they're awkward to work with. Now, so the top line there is just saying we have perfect state transfer from A to B. Now, U of T is a unitary matrix, so the vector on the left and the vector on the right must have the same length, and they both supposed to have length 1. That's why gamma must be a complex number of norm 1. Okay. Now, um, U of T is a power series in A, so it commutes with A, and so um, I can say that u of k t applied to a to the k e sub a is equal to this, um, and we pull that through, and you get gamma um, times e to the k, a to the k times e sub b. Now, what I'm going to do next is I want to take the inner product, the complex inner product of this with this, and this with this. So I'm going to take those two inner product, the first two, and the inner product of the second. Now, one thing we know that, barring mistakes I'm about to make, they should be equal. 
Okay, um, so let's do it. So this is the, the, this is the taking the left hand side. Now the point is, this is a unity matrix. I'm using the complex inner product, so it, it's invisible. <laughs> you can throw it away. And so this just becomes E A comma A to the K E A, which I can write explicitly in this form. And that, of course, is just the A A entry of A to the K. So that's the left hand side. On the right hand side, I'm using a complex inner product. This is a complex number of norm one, so it goes away and you get this. And so that's the proof. Okay, so this proves that the, um, for if I have state transfer from vertex A to vertex B, then the number of closed walks of length K at the vertex A is equal to the number of closed walks of length K at vertex B for any K. And so we have a graph theory consequence of the existence of perfect state transfer. No, it doesn't work when I do that. Um, now, okay, so I want to extract a few bit more information from this. Um, the um, basically, what we're going to see is if I have perfect state transfer at some time t from a to b, I also get perfect state transfer if I start at b to a at the same time. Now, it's not that they're happening simultaneously on the same system. What we're saying is if you get perfect state transfer when you start at a at time t to b, then if you start at b at time t, you'll get perfect state transfer to a. And then I'm going to use this to extract the consequence. The, basically, what I'm doing is I've shown you that if perfect state transfer occurs, there's kind of a linear algebra consequence. The AA entry of a to k is equal to the BB entry of a to the k. Now, it turns out there's also some number theory consequences. And it's the combination of these two which you use to actually um, do the heavy lifting. Um, so um, the statement simply is if I have perfect state transfer there from A to B, then um, I claim that I also get the U of T applied to E sub B is the same gamma times E sub A. And by composing those two statements, you get that U T of A A, the A entry view at time 2t is gamma squared, which is a complex number of norm 1. And if I have a unity matrix with a complex number of norm 1 on the diagonal, all the other entries in that row and column must be 0. Okay, so it's meaning something. Uh, so you're assuming that gamma is norm 1? I, yeah, the, I don't really have to assume it. Um, I, this is a vector of norm 1. U is t is unity, so this has got norm 1. So this must have norm 1, and E of E has got norm 1. Yes, so that it's forced, yeah. <laughs> or, or you can assume it, it's all actually whichever makes you happy at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, th this is quite straight, well, one little, so if this is true, we have perfect state transfer, I just move the E's and the gammas over the opposite sides, and I get gamma inverse E sub A is U of minus T E sub B. Now, the, I wrote up before, you will have forgotten, but U of minus T is equal to the complex conjugate of U of T, um, and so if I take complex conjugates of both sides, you actually get this. So it's straightforward and you don't need to worry about the proof. There's not going to be a test. Uh, so the, the thing I'm really interested in here, um, the fact that you get this symmetry is, is useful and important, but the thing I really um, want, want to use here is if I get perfect state transfer, well, actually, I slipped something by you before because I talked about the case where I had my um, I said I wanted my probability density supported at a vertex. And then I started talking about perfect state transfer. So there you think transfer from one vertex to another. Now, a reasonable question would be, what if it's the same vertex? So it's quite possible, and this is what's happening. So what we're saying is if you get perfect state transfer from A to B at time T, in some sense you get transfer from A to itself at time 2T. So if at time t you're guaranteed to be on the vertex B, then at time 2t you, you're guaranteed to be back home. Would be a simple way of stating it. Um, now the, okay, so, um, and so in that sense, so in this case we say that the walk is, uh, or the graph, depending on my mood, is periodic at the vertex A. So there's a time, in this case 2t, such that u of t Applied to E sub A is a number of norm 1 times E sub A. So we get this periodicity. Now, the thing about periodicity is simply is that it's easier to work with than perfect state transfer. And it's a simple consequence of perfect state transfer. And to state the result that I need, I need one more technical term. Um, now, the, actually, this is a good, right? I did, um, uh, the, 
Um, the main tool that I use in working with this stuff is the spectral decomposition. And so that means I'm working with the eigenvalues and the um, projections onto the eigenspaces. And I'll write this out more formally later when I need more detail. So for each eigenspace, there's a projection. And I'm denoting those by the, eigens the projection corresponding to the eigenvalue theta sub s is going to be e sub s. Um, and so the... Um, Actually, I was tempted just to leave this out because it's the sort of thing you could get by in a talk and no one would notice. Um, but the, I say that an eigenvalue theta of S of A lies in the eigenvalue support of, of the vertex A if the diagonal entry of this E sub S is not zero. Uh, equivalently, this says that the projection of the vector little E sub A onto the eigenspace is not zero, which is exactly what I should have written. But so, it, so we're looking for the eigenvalues theta sub S such that the projections of E sub A onto those eigen spaces is not zero. The other ones we just throw away. They're going to be invisible. So this is just a technical definition, but I, um, otherwise what I'm about to say next would be a lie. Um, come on. Um, so the, I established one consequence of the existence of perfect state transport before, namely that the two vertices had this property that the number of closed walks on the two vertices were equal. So now we're getting our second condition, which is called the ratio condition. And so I'm taking four eigenvalues of the graph. Don't have to be different, just some four eigen... Well, um, actually, two of them have to be different. So you'll see four eigenvalues. Um, and the important thing is they lie in the eigenvalue support. Now, for beginners, there's no harm in assuming that the eigenvalue support is all the eigenvalues. It won't cause any problems at this point. So we're picking four eigenvalues in the eigenvalue support. Um, and we're just going to assume that k, theta k and theta l are different. And the conclusion is um, that this ratio um, is a rational number. Well, um, that's actually quite surprising because what are the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues of the graph are the zeros of its character polynomial. Now, the adjacency matrix is integer, so the character polynomial is a monic integer polynomial. So the eigenvalues are algebraic integers. <coughs> okay? And so if you pick a graph at random and pick four eigenvalues and compute this ratio, um, that, that ratio will be an algebraic number, but it's not going to be rational, as a rule. It's probably one, in some sense, it's going to be a, a, a not rational. So, um, well, I might say a little bit more of this in a second, but um, so the, the, the key thing is that the, the eigenvalues are fairly wild, then they're not rational as a rule. In fact, if they're rational, they must be integers. Okay. All you're guaranteed is algebraic integers, but what this is telling you is that if you have perfect state transfer, then um, the eigenvalues must satisfy this ratio condition. Um, and I'm again going to um, sketch the proof of that. Sorry, but can you just choose that set theta r and theta s equal r? Sorry. Yeah, that would work. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So when you say rational is the subset of the reals, yeah, yeah, and it's, just, it's, it's just the rational, it's just the, yeah. You know, um, yeah, um, this is quite a strong condition, so um, you can use this fairly quickly to show that you can't get perfect state transfer on the path on four vertices. Um, I haven't gone through it. You do get perfect state transfer on the path on two vertices and the path on three vertices, but not on the path on four vertices, and this is the easiest way of proving it. You get the argument with these and work it out. There's a little bit of calculation involved, but it's doable. So we have this ratio condition. Um, now, um, okay, so this is where I wrote out the details about the um, projections. So as I said, the main tool that I use in this is spectral decomposition. Um, so I've got a, a real symmetric matrix with eigenvalues theta 1 up, blah, blah, blah. And the eigenspace belonging to theta r is determined by the projection E sub r onto that subspace. And so you get a, a family of projections, and I just summarize the basic properties. They sum to the identity, because the direct sum of the eigenspace is, is, the full, is r to the n. Um, each of these matrices is positively semi-definite, because they're symmetric and their squares equal to themselves. Um, there's a, or their projections, this is long and the short of it. Um, they're, they're orthogonal. If r is not equal to s, then their product is zero. And um, the important thing here is if f is a real function defined on each eigenvalue of a, then the value f of a is g given by this formula. Now, this is useful both in theory and practice. In practice, if, if I got the adjacency image in my graph, I can compute these E sub r's, 
And so I can use this to compute u of t, because u of t is just a function on the values of the eigenvalues. Um, and you'll see that in a second. So, um, so this is what we, um, so I think of all this as spectral decomposition. Um, and so the important thing is that once I have these projections, I can write out fairly explicit formulas for u of t. Um, and so that's my basic tool. Um, so, um, well, let's run through proof this ratio condition. Um, the key thing is we're told, okay, um, it, the, the graph's periodic, so there's a time t such that ut um, with aa is equal to um, a complex number of norm 1. Now, okay, so I need a formula for the aa entry of ut, and there it is. Okay, so this is the f of the eigenvalue, and this is my eigenpotent. So I've just used that last formula on the previous frame. So that's my formula. So I've got a, a, it's a linear combination of complex numbers of norm 1, because E di t theta's got norm 1. And the projections are real matrices, so the uh, AAs are real numbers. Now, in fact, their projections, they're partially semi-definite, so the, these diagonal entries are non-negative. And also, since the E sub R sum to the identity, the, that second sum must be equal to 1. So the point here is I've got a combination of these eigen numbers here of norm 1. This is a convex combination. The coefficients are non-negative and sum to 1. So what I'm saying is the AA entry of U of T is a convex combination of numbers on the unit circle. Now, if we want the graph to be periodic at T, that complex convex combination of numbers on the unit circle has got to have absolute value 1. And so now think about it. You pick a bunch of numbers on the unit circle and try and find a convex combination of those numbers which has got absolute value 1. The only way you can do it is pick one of the vertices you started with. In fact, they must all be equal. Okay. And so that's... Um, you know, so that brings us down to this. Um, so the, the point then is the absolute value of this is 1, if and only if these guys um, are all equal. And so equivalently that says E di t theta r minus theta s is equal to 1 for all r and s. And so that tells me that t times theta r minus theta s is an integer m multiple of pi. Um, and then I take the ratio of two of those. The t's go away. And I get a ratio of two differences. And the conclusion is I'm rational. Okay, so we're using a spectral decomposition um, and a little bit of sort of convex geometry um, until we get the ratio condition. Um, so I'm not going to work out how we get the consequences. We're going to list some of the consequences that we get from the theory that I've described. Um, the only path that emits perfect state transfer um, are the paths of on two vertices and three vertices. Now, in some ways, this is bad news because if you're trying to have a network and you want to transfer information, then the obvious, the cheapest network to use will be a path. <laughs> and this is telling you, bad luck, guys, paths aren't going to work um, in most cases. This is surprisingly difficult to prove, actually. Um, the next thing I proved using, and so, um, well, the, who proved that's a little complicated. The next thing, something that I proved, is that if you fix an integer k, um, I proved there's only finitely many graphs with maximal valency k on which perfect state transfer occurs. So there's only, so um, you look at the graphs with maximum valency 3, there's only finitely many such graphs on which perfect state transfer occurs. So that, that's giving you, telling you in a very strong sense that perfect state transfer um, is rare. Okay. Um, now, uh, the um, people have looked at vertex transitive graphs, um, and so there's a characterization of sorts for circular graphs that emit perfect state transfer, but it's fairly complicated. It's more of a recipe than a characterization. Um, the other comment here is uh, I've been working with the adjacency matrix. Um, now, the physicists themselves don't always use the adjacency matrix. They're willing to use um, the Laplacian, for example. It arises quite naturally. Um, and in that case, for the Laplacian, we know that you don't get perfect state transfer um, on any tree with more than two vertices. Um, we, oh, we'll come back to that later. Um, and the, we also determined the, went through the complete list of known distributed graphs and worked out where perfect state transfer occurred. Now, one reason for doing this is I like just regular graphs, but the other reason is, in some sense, many of the most interesting examples of perfect state transfer come from distant regular graphs. And so this is a um, 
useful piece of work. So that's sort of a summary of some of the things we know about the state transfer. Um, and uh, well, one question which is still open, so um, whether there's a tree on more than two vertices on which perfect state transfer occurs. We're inclined to think not, but we don't really know where to start. And that's a fairly simple question. Um, the, um, it would be nice to characterize the vertex transitive graphs to emit perfect state transfer, although I think that's more of a long-term project than a question, and I won't go into that. Um, and the other one is technical, but gives an example of sort of things happen. In all the known cases where you get perfect state transfer, that gamma that turns up is a root of unity. So there's some integer m such that gamma of m is equal to 1. But I can't prove that's necessarily true. It would be useful if it was, because it causes you a lot of problems when you have to allow it for it to be other things. So you know, it's a technical question, the sort of thing that comes out of it. Um, and so you can prove it is in many cases. So, okay, so there's your, I've given you a summary of what we, um, some of the things we know about perfect state transfer and a few questions. Um, and so I'm going to go on to the, um, well, yeah, and this is kind of interesting. So the point is, once you decide that perfect state transfer is rare, you think for a bit, and then you realize, well, I'm working for physicists here, and physicists are usually happy with it, they don't require 100% accuracy, they'll let you have a bit of slop. <laughs> you know, it's good enough for government work. Um, and so um, we come out with, so the problem is that you know I'm trying to arrange a time t picking my vertices a and b and a time t such that at time t the absolute entry value of the entry the a b entry of u of t is equal to one and it's hard to do. So what if instead we say well let's say what if I can just get close enough so you give me the, the issue is that you're going to give me a, a, an epsilon and I'm going to say here's the time t and you, yes you'll get within one minus epsilon. <coughs> Okay, and then, the, and, the kind of, and then for any epsilon, I want to be able to do that. So my prop, you're going to give me epsilon. For each epsilon you give me, I want to have to say, yes, there's a time t for which I can get that accuracy. Okay, so that's what I'm calling pretty good state transfer. And so the next, um, this will give you a definition. So there's the um, definition for pretty good state transfer, simply that for um, each epsilon greater than zero, there's a time t such that this happens. Okay, um, so, well, it's uh, what happens. Um, well, we looked at paths. We've looked at other cases. We, I mean, there's lots of more questions and answers as usual. Um, one consequence, um, which I'm not going to bother to prove, is if PGST does occur, then the vertices A and B must have this property with the closed walks, which I'm referring to as closed spectral. So that property still holds. But the, so the, the linear algebra part of things is still there, but the eigenvalue condition, the ratio condition, sorry, is it doesn't come into play. There's no ratio condition. So you still have restrictions of the sort that you get from counting closed walks, but you don't get the ratio condition. So this is just a bit of background. Um, and well, here's the result. So we're looking at the path, which is the obvious place to start. Now, the, remember for a path, on n vertices, if n's 2 or 3, you do get perfect state transfer, but it's proved that for n greater than 3, you don't. Now, what's happening here is for, if you allow pretty good state transfer, well, you get something quite different. If n plus 1, the number of vertices, n's number of vertices in the path, is a power of 2, a prime, or a twice a prime, you get pretty good state transfer, otherwise you don't. Now, this was completely unexpected. Um, we're using Kronecker's theorem and things like this, and so and um, the problem in a certain, it's not too hard to show that in those cases you do get pretty good state transfer. The problem is to show it doesn't occur in any other cases. Um, now, uh, yeah, it's, so it's a rather weird collection number theory conditions. Um, the other, pro there's a problem too that you realize that um, when you get perfect state transfer, I was getting perfect state transfer at times pi and two. It tends to occur, if it does, at short times. Um, the, to get pretty good state transfer, you may have to wait a long while. And I'm not quite sure what the physical significance of that would be. Um, the, just to show this is not an entire accident, we also looked at the Laplacian version of this. As I said, the physicists have a number of different models, and normally the model you're working with you produces the adjacency matrix, but you can also get the Laplacian matrix. And so we eventually um, thought about that for a while, got stuck for a while. Um, for the, if you use the Laplacian matrix, 
um, then you get pretty good state transfer, if any, if the number of vertices is a power of two or a prime. So the situation, it's a little harder to get perfect state transfer with the Laplacian, and again, a little harder to get perfect state transfer with the um, pretty good state transfer with Laplacian. And so that's fairly recent work. Um, so, um, well, and there are some other examples. Generally speaking, you get pretty good state transfer of some silly number theory, if some number is a perfect square or something. Um, it's a strange phenomenon. Okay, so um, so that's it for the um, perfect state transfer. So I want to go on to the um, other end of this. Um, the, you know, I was t talking about two different forms of my probability density. So now I want to go back to uniform mixing. So I'm looking for times t, where m of t is a constant times the all-ones matrix J. Okay. Now, uh, well, so... You know, you're very tired of me working with the path, so I thought I'd do something slightly more complicated. I'm going to work with the complete graph. Now, for the complete graph, um, what I've written up there is actually the spectral decomposition. The complete graph has two eigenvalues, n minus 1 with multiplicity 1 and minus 1 with multiplicity n minus 1. And so this 1 over n times j is one of the projections onto the... It's the projection onto that eigenspace. It's the projection onto the constant vectors. And this is the projection onto the vectors whose entries sum to 0. And so that's the spectral decomposition. Okay, and once I've got that, so u of t is, uh, okay, so I'm now going to apply a function f, namely x of i times, x of i t times, and so then you get immediately from the spectral decomposition that u of t is e to the i t times the first eigenvalue, times the eigenpotent, plus e to the minus i t, that's e to the t times, e to the i t times minus one times the second, and so, um, and then you rearrange a little bit, and so there's your formula for u of t. So you have a, an explicit formula for u of t. So you can do more than just k2. If you use spectral decomposition, we can write out the paths explicitly. Um, now, it's worth looking at this a little bit. Um, so this is u of t. Now, we're only concerned about absolute values, and this thing here is what the physicists call a phase factor, and you can throw it away because you're taking absolute values. Um, think about what goes on here. Um, take n equals 100, e to the int, well, it's between minus 1 and 1. So when n is large, this stuff here is small. And so u of t is approximately the identity matrix. Now, the more you think about this, the weirder this is, will seem. I mean, we're, the physicists are calling these things quantum walks. You normally, with a random walk on any structure, these things spread out and smear. And, you know, especially when the structure is highly regular. Now, you can't get anything more highly regular than the complete graph. But what's happening on the complete graph is essentially your, your quantum walker stays home with very high probability. So with probability um, 1 minus 2 over n, you, when you do your measurement, you're always back in your initial state. <laughs> okay. So this is, the, the most, this is the, the most concrete example I have that you're actually dealing with quantum physics and not, and not something um, more familiar. So you, you wouldn't expect this. Um, so you get a couple of consequences of this. Um, I mean, uh, the, so we, we know, okay, so we know generally when n is large, this is trying to be just the uh, scalar times the identity. Um, the, uh, what you can deduce from this is that we, we actually do get uniform mixing on k2 and k4 at time pi on 4. You can work out the formulas. I gave you the formula. It's a now little exercise. You do get uniform mixing at time pi on 4. And so it follows the um, Cartesian powers of those graphs um, a bit uniform mixing at time pi on 4. So you get infinite families. In fact, you can take products of k2 and k4, um, which is what I said next. If you take the complete graph on three vertices, you get uniform mixing at time 2 pi on 9. And so that gives you a second um, in, or example and then a second infinite flaming examples. And finally, if n is greater than or equal to 5, then you look at that formula, there's no uniform mixing. Now, in some ways, this is surprising. It's less surprising what I was just saying about U of T being close to the identity, that you don't get uniform mixing when n is large. So this is one reason why any intuition you have about classical continuous walks is um, not going to be widely, widely useful in this subject. Okay. Um, so we don't get uniform mixing if n is five or more. Um, but uh, I originally thought uniform mixing wasn't very interesting, but uh, well, if you look there, I've got a list. I've got powers of k2, powers of k4, powers of k3. I have infinite 
families of examples. There's a lot of graphs there, um, and so it can happen. Um, and so I thought it was worth thinking about some more, and other people did too. Um, I'll come back to that, I think. Um, I wanted to look about what happens to bipartite graphs. Um, one of the things I find interesting in this subject is that um, a lot of the time, you, you know, I'm used to work, you know, I'm an algebraic graph theory. I've worked with eigenvalues and spectral decomposition all my mathematical life. Um, but now suddenly I find myself being forced to use stuff about algebraic number theory and even transcendental number theory. Okay, so it's, it, there's two aspects to this and they're both interesting. Um, the, I want to consider, um, basically what I'm really thinking about is uniform mixing on bipartite graphs. Okay, so um, it turns out you can say a bit more in that case. Um, I'll give you the summary of what we do know shortly. Um, but the, um, I want to, um, well basically, my problem with uniform mixing, well with perfect state transfer, we have a good estimates about if it happens, we know it can't happen too soon and it can't happen too late. And so if I've got no better ideas, I can get one of my students to run a few program, you know, do some computations in SAGE and just see what happens on a particular graph and get some good ideas. Now with uniform mixing, I don't have bounds on time as a rule. And so it's much harder, to, you, know, you can run it and it's, very, it's much harder to recognize. And especially now you know you can get this pretty good stuff and so you've got to be very careful. You look at the figure, you can't be sure whether you're getting what you want, precise uniform mixing, or just some approximation to it. Okay, so, um, so but for bipartite graphs, we learned recently we can do something, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit. The first thing is if the graph's bipartite, um, then the, um, you can show that the, uh, okay, well, I'm thinking about uniform mixing. So that means that I'm going to be looking at a situation where I want the, a, the A row of U of T to be flat. If I'm going to get uniform mixing, that's got to happen. Now, if the A, now the surprise, something I need to go through here, which is not very complicated, but the important thing is that if the, um, if we're bipartite, and, and if you know this is flat, then the entries of U of T have to be either plus or minus 1 over N, N's number of vertices, or plus or minus I over N. Now, this is not deep, okay? Um, you can work it out, it's um, a bit of matrix theory, it's a standard calculation. So if they're flat, these are what they are, okay? Um, so in particular, they're algebraic numbers, okay? Now, the other comment is that the entries of our matrix eigenpotent, C sub R, are also algebraic numbers. This is not, you're not going to, if you haven't met, played with these before, this will be less obvious, but okay, you can, well, as I say, trust me, I'm a doctor. Um, so the... Um, we're assuming, so um, the entries of UT are algebraic, the entries of this are algebraic, so the stuff on the right hand side must be algebraic. Now the entries of this are algebraic, well that's just um, entries of E sub R, so it follows that the E to the IT theta R is an algebraic number. Now in general, you know, exponentials of algebraics aren't algebraic, <laughs> um, and that's what we're going to deal as, as, as our little lever. Um, so the conclusion is that um, if I have uniform mixing, or more precisely, if the EA row of um, UT is, or column in this case, is flat, then these guys, E to the IT theta R, must be algebraic. Now, for one eigenvalue, that's not a problem. You can find the time T and make it algebraic. Okay, but we have a bunch of them, and that's the, um, well, the, oh, and this is the tool we're going to use. If alpha and beta are algebraic numbers and alpha to beta is algebraic, then beta is rational, barring trivial cases. This is the Gelfand Schneider theorem. Um, and the theorem is that if a bipartite graph emits uniform mixing, then the ratios of its eigenvalues must be rational. So instead of ratios of eigenvalue differences, I have ratios of eigenvalues. So this is a ratio condition, and here's the proof. It's not even one line. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is algebraic, this is algebraic, algebraic to algebraic can't be algebraic. Okay. So we do have an eigenvalue condition, um, so the ratio condition does come to play, and so this is an example of the, well, I found it cute anyway. Um, so the summary, um, this is going, the um, so what do we know about uniform mixing? Well, we've sorted out for complete graphs, and so the natural thing to do is look at cycles, and they're regular, you'd think that's a good candidate. 
Um, the only even cycle that emits uniform mixing is the cycle on four vertices. Um, and that follows more or less from machinery I've just shown you. So you can do that. Um, it's not too bad. Oh, so it's still not trivial. You still need the Golf and Schneider theorem, for example. Um, the um, cycle on three vertices is a complete graph on three vertices. That does emit uniform mixing, so this is not quite right. A cycle of prime length greater than three um, does not emit uniform mixing. This is non-trivial, but you can get a, the pretty good uniform mixing. Okay. Neither of these statements are trivial at all. They're proved by um, Natalie Mullen, who was my student at the time. Um, and she conjectured that if n is at least 5, then a Cody graph for integers mod n um, to the d does not emit uniform mixing. Um, I'm a bit more conservative with my conjectures than she is. I'm a bit worried about the case n equals 6. But the general thing would be that these guys don't emit uniform mixing. The results I'm describing are on the archive. Um, now, um, there's some fairly heavy machinery that goes into some of this stuff, so, so algebraic geometry and, um, and um, yeah, so, uh, but, so this is not at all simple. Come on. Okay, um, so to finish off, which are words you want to hear, um, I want to take a different tack. Um, now, well, this is again related to mixing, which is why mixing's in the title. Um, but the, as well as trying to understand, you know, what are the conditions that constrain perfect state transfer and constrain uniform mixing, at some point you'd like to get more concrete um, transfer of information. So, it, it, so read off information about the graph from properties of these walks. So the idea is we look, uh, and we, I'm just starting. We're just starting this is to look for in, invariant, interesting graph invariants that we can calculate using these quantum walks. Now, of course, if you find that, I mean, this is actually is not a, it's not easy, and b is potentially very useful. I mean, if you come out with a sufficiently interesting invariant, you may come up with a quantum algorithm. Okay, so um, you know it's not a short-term project, but so the um, one of the things you want to do is to think of things, you know, think of parameters. You know, the physics is giving us or in it leading us to interesting parameters, and that's what I wanted to um, discuss here. So this is my um, exa one example. Um, now the problem about, as I said, the people physicists will say that um, quantum walks are an analogs of classical continuous walks. But classical continuous walks, well, in the long term, they're pretty boring. Everything's smeared uniformly across the state space, and there's nothing more to be said. Now, of course, there are interesting questions you can ask, but the long term, they settle down. Whereas, as we've seen, um, quantum walks don't settle down. I mean, they can be periodic, but whatever happens, I mean, I gave you that plot for the P4 at the start of the talk. The, there's no um, sense in which things settle down to a nice um, limiting distribution. Now, what to do in that, all of our tricks for dealing with this, and so the um, obvious suggestion, this is what people do, is to take an average. And so what I'm going to do now is I compute, basically computing the average value of M of T. So and actually technically this is a Cesaro sum in Fourier series. So you're taking an integral of M of T dt from zero to T, so you're integrating each entry of the matrix, if you're not used to this, from zero to T, and then you divide by the length the interval, and then take the limit as T goes to infinity. Um, so that gives you, well, I mean, it makes mathematical sense, um, but it's actually something you can, you can compute. Um, and so there's the matrix for the path on six vertices. So the, I'll go back a second. So the, I've got this definition here, given uh, by this integral. Now I can give other formulas by replacing using spectral decomposition and Schur products, but I'm not about to do that now. And the point, so I, I can compute this. It's going to be a well-defined matrix. Um, you have to work a little bit, but it falls out. It's well-defined. Um, now, the, for example, um, I mean, this is an average. And so since M of T is a non-negative matrix, the average will be non-negative. Since M of T is doubly stochastic, this average M hat will be non-negative. So there are things you can read off. Okay, so uh, there you are. So it, it exists, and it's there. Um, and it's an invariant of the well, graph and the wall well, of the graph really. Um, and as I said, well, okay, here's the example, path on six vertices. Um, now the um, so okay, so the entries are either th three over two on the diagonal, three over two on the anti-diagonal, and one everywhere else. 
Um, there's already a surprise there. Um, you would, you know, I would expect, um, well, I'm not too surprised to see some symmetry with the one, say, the one six one one entry and the one six entry being equal, and the one, these two being equal and these two being equal, but I don't see why those two should be equal. You would think that the entries would depend on the distance between the vertices in the path. And that's not what's happening. And this is not just an accident if you go to the path on nine, but the other paths you see a similar pattern. So there's, in some sense, more symmetry there than you expect at first. Uh, well, you know, you can pick another graph. So here's a graph on six vertices, essentially random. Actually, it's not random at all, but um, in any sense of the word. Um, and <laughs> there's the average mixing matrix for that. Um, so that looks like a complete mess. Um, but the point still is, well, it's still there. The rows still sum to one, the columns sum to one. It's a well-defined object. Um, we can read off things. Uh, if you have perfect state, well, I think it's on the next frame, but if you have perfect state transfer between two vertices, then the corresponding rows of this matrix must be equal. So it's measuring, it's related to that. Um, and I'm just going to give you a short summary of some, well, the, the, the first course, I guess. First thing, there is a, an explicit formula for M hat in terms of the matrix idempotence. So you take the Schur squares and sum them. Okay, so that's um, now the Schur squares are always non-negative, so that's a you know it's a well-defined sum. It's not something I'd ever thought of doing. I mean, summing the E sub R's is nice. That's just the identity. Um, summing the Schur squares I hadn't thought about. But the other thing is that M hat is a rational matrix, which follows from the first line. Um, that was quite a surprise to me before because I had that previous example. You look at that; it doesn't seem like it's going to be rational. Um, but eventually enough of them were. Um, so you can prove it's rational and it actually follows a bit of Goa theory in from this formula here. Um, as I said, um, two vertices, well, I'm, don't worry about something goes spectral. There's perfect state transfer um, from A to B, then the corresponding rows of M hat must be equal. The converse is not true. It doesn't imply, um, yeah, so if there's perfect state transfer, the two rows must be equal. But if the two rows are equal, you don't get perfect state transfer necessarily. You that just takes care of linear algebra, not the number theory. Um, another thing's kind of interesting is that the, um, well, th this would be in some sense the simplest case. It, you know, if you're looking at a random, wa random walk on a normal situation and you look at the limiting distribution, you expect to see something like 1 on n times your 1's matrix. And so what we're saying here is the only way that happens um, is when x is a complete graph on two vertices. Um, so, um, but the real point of this um, and something we're just starting on is that you know, this is a reasonably, you know, it's a natural invariant. It's reasonably easy to compute. Um, there are a number of questions you can ask, none of which we've answered yet, or almost none of which. Um, and it's an interesting graph invariant. And I think it's potentially interesting from a physics point of view. And oh, that still doesn't work. You think I'd learn? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thanks for your attention. That's